Well, welcome back folks to another exciting chemistry video. Today, we are going to be starting our final unit, which is primarily focusing on applications of thermal dynamics. That is, we're going to be taking information that we have found in our thermal dynamics unit, utilizing thermal dynamic data, and determining primarily whether reactions occur spontaneously or whether they are non-spontaneous. Today, our introduction is going to be over the concepts of entropy and Gibbs free energy. So we are primarily going to focus on measuring levels of disorder. That is, how do we know if disorder is increasing or decreasing? And then by utilizing that numeric value, along with our enthalpy and temperature, we can then calculate the Gibbs free energy and based on that value, determine if a reaction is thermodynamically favorable or spontaneous or non-thermodynamically favorable or non-spontaneous. We'll talk a little bit more about what those terms mean here in just a little bit, but as always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you here in just a moment. That seems like a moment. Let's go. So hopefully by the end of this video, you will be able to explain the concepts of entropy. You should be able to evaluate chemical reactions and temperature changes for increases or decreases in entropy. You should be able to explain Gibbs free energy and how it's used to determine thermodynamic favorability, as well as calculate it based on standard delta G values or temperature, entropy, and enthalpy. Understand how the sign of delta G tells us whether a process is thermodynamically favorable. Consider positive and negative values for entropy and enthalpy and determine if a process is spontaneous or non-spontaneous based on those values. And understand how high activation energy can play a role in thermodynamically favorable reactions occurring very slowly or not at all. I'm very excited to bring this information to you today, so let's get started. So let's go and dive into a little bit about entropy. And entropy is just simply the measure of the disorder of a system. So you can think of as entropy increases, so does the disorder of a system. Well, what do we mean by disorder? Well, think about the spacing in between the molecules. So for example, a phase change between a solid and a liquid. Solid molecules have more order. They're more close to each other. So therefore, uh, as you would melt ice and convert it to liquid water, you would be increasing in entropy. Consider chemical reactions and phase changes. If we have two solids and react them together and it produces a gas, well, that is an increase in entropy. So therefore, delta S, which is our value for entropy, is going to be positive. Number of moles increases. If we have more moles of product as a result of our reaction, therefore, we would have more disorder as opposed to fewer moles. Or even just an increase in temperature. Think about kinetic molecular theory. Molecules at a higher temperature typically move around faster than those of a slower temperature. So as a result, those molecules moving faster is an increase in disorder. So we should be able to look at a chemical reaction or a chemical or physical process and very easily be able to determine if the entropy increases or if it decreases. So much like enthalpy, we can calculate absolute entropy change by subtracting the entropy of the product by the entropy of the reactants. And again, don't forget your coefficients here. Those are very important as you go through and calculate that. So if I have two moles of something in my products, I want to multiply whatever the absolute entropy of that particular chemical is by two. So again, a very straightforward way to go through and calculate that, the sum of your products minus the sum of your reactants, just like what we've done with enthalpy. Now, Gibbs free energy is a really important value because that helps us determine whether a reaction is thermodynamically favorable slash spontaneous. The term I would like you to use is thermodynamically favorable as opposed to spontaneous because spontaneous kind of has this connotation where it's occurring very, very quickly. Um, thermodynamically favorable reactions can occur quickly, but they can also occur very slowly as well. Remember that the rate at which a reaction takes place has to do with kinetics, not necessarily having to do with delta G or an equilibrium constant value for K, that type of thing. If the delta G is less than zero, the reaction is considered thermodynamically favorable and will proceed towards your products. If delta G is more than zero, it is thermodynamically unfavorable and will not proceed towards your products. If delta G is zero, you are at equilibrium and we'll relate the values of delta G and K in a little bit later video. Again, spontaneous just simply means without external forces. It has nothing to do with the speed of the reaction. That has to do with kinetics and rate law. So much like enthalpy, standard Gibbs free energy change is the difference between the free energy of the products minus the free energy of the reactants, just like what we looked at before with entropy and enthalpy. If I know the standard Gibbs free energy of my products and that of my reactants, I can subtract my reactants from my products and get the delta G of the entire reaction. 
please don't forget coefficients, just like what we talked about with enthalpy and entropy. Now, another way that we can calculate Gibbs free energy is by utilizing the values of enthalpy, entropy, and temperature. This is given to you by the formula delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. One thing you want to be aware of as you go through and complete these types of problems is to be aware of your units. Delta G is in kilojoules per mole. Delta H is in kilojoules per mole. However, entropy is given in joules per mole times Kelvin. So this typically needs to be converted to kilojoules in order to be able to be used in this equation. So very important to make sure that we notice that, especially with delta S, and make the appropriate adjustments to our value before we plug it into our equation. Let's take a look at a sample problem. In the Haber process for the manufacture of ammonia, we're given an equation, and we are given a delta H as well as a delta S. So is this reaction spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius, and what temperature will it be spontaneous? So we have two things we're going to need to be able to solve for here. We need to determine if the reaction is spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius, and then at what temperature will it become spontaneous? So what we're going to do here is we're just going to take a look at the information that we're given and figure out that we're going to need to use our delta G equals delta H minus T delta S formula. We're then going to plug in our values. We have negative 93 kilojoules per mole. Our temperature, 25 degrees Celsius in Kelvin, is 298 Kelvin. But remember, we need to take our delta S and convert that to kilojoules per mole. So we we'll do a little bit of stoichiometry, divide that by 1,000, and we get 0.198 and a negative value for that. So we basically just we plug these into our calculator. We solve, we get a delta G is negative 34 kilojoules per mole, which tells me that yes, this reaction is spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable because delta G is a negative value. Based on that information, we can determine that this is a thermodynamically favorable reaction. So at what temperature will it be spontaneous? Well, what we're going to do here is we are going to say that when delta G is zero, that is kind of the turning point between a reaction being spontaneous and non-spontaneous. Yes, a delta G of zero does mean that it is at equilibrium, but it is that point at which we determine uh, the difference between a reaction that is spontaneous and non-spontaneous. So basically, we're just now going to solve for temperature by plugging in the other variables. So we're going to assume that delta G is zero because that's when we're going to go from a non-spontaneous reaction to a spontaneous one. We have negative 93 kilojoules for my enthalpy. We have negative 0.198 for my entropy, and I am solving for temperature. So I do a little bit of algebra manipulation. I plug in and solve, and what I get is a temperature that is 469 Kelvin. At that particular temperature is when this reaction becomes spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable. So a couple different ways that we can approach these types of problems, but again, making sure we know which variables go where, plugging in and solving, it's all pretty straightforward if you go through and think about it in detail. All right, let's move on. So one thing that we can do is based off of the signs given by delta H and delta S, we can make estimations for delta G. So we don't actually have to go through and do any necessary calculations. We can just do a little bit of thinking in terms of if delta H is this sign and delta S is this sign, what does the sign for delta G have to be or could be based on the temperature? So for example, if delta H is positive and delta S is negative, well, a positive minus a negative is always going to give you a positive value, regardless of whatever numbers you put in there. So if we have that particular situation where delta H is positive and delta S is negative, the reaction is always going to be not thermodynamically favorable or not spontaneous. The opposite can be said if delta H is negative and delta S is positive. This will always result in a negative delta G value and therefore will always be thermodynamically favorable or spontaneous. Now, if both signs are the same, that is a negative minus a negative or a positive minus a positive, it's going to depend on the values of delta H and delta S as to whether or not the reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So for example, if delta H and delta S are both negative, the reaction is going to be non-spontaneous at a high temperature because high temperatures are going to result in a positive delta G, whereas low temperatures would result in, the, in a negative delta G. And the opposite can be said if both are positive. A pi, positive minus a positive, well, if we have a high temperature, that delta S is going to be really, really large. And therefore, when we subtract that from delta H, we're going to get a value that is negative. So therefore, at a high temperature, that would be spontaneous. And at a low temperature, it would be non-spontaneous. 
So it really is a nice way to be able to very quickly determine if this reaction is thermodynamically favorable or not based off of the information that's given in this chart and thinking about delta H and delta S just in terms of their positive and negative values. It makes it much, much easier to go through and perform those types of calculations rather than having to do the entire math problem. So again, just a quick look at these based on whether delta H is greater than zero, delta S is greater than zero or less than zero. Utilize either one of these charts and study it carefully because that information is going to be very helpful and make your life a whole lot easier rather than having to actually go through and mathematically determine the value for delta G. So let's talk a little bit about the concept of kinetic control. A reaction may be thermodynamically favorable, but that does not correlate to the speed of the reaction. Think of rusting as an example. Unprotected iron over time is going to oxidize, forming iron oxide. So because there's no external force that's applied to this, we can say that it has a negative delta G value and is thermodynamically favorable. However, it does not occur at a very fast rate by any means. Some pieces of iron may take years to form rust. So many reactions are thermodynamically favorable, but occur very slowly due to the fact that it has a high activation energy. Remember that the value for delta G does not correlate to the speed of the reaction. The speed of the reaction is based off of kinetics, activation energy, rate law, those types of things. So while rusting is a thermodynamically favorable process, it occurs very slowly because the reaction between iron and oxygen has a very high activation energy. The term we use for this to describe is kinetic control. The kinetics of the reaction appears to control the thermodynamic favorability. However, that is not necessarily true. So just kind of keep these things in mind, especially the concept of kinetic control. That is, reactions may occur spontaneously, but occur very slowly due to the high activation energy that's required from the reaction itself. Well, that's all I have for you today. Hopefully you understand the concepts of entropy, be able to calculate delta G, understand what delta G means, and then understand how high activation energy plays a role in the thermodynamically favorable reactions proceeding very slowly. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching. And as always, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and we will see you in the next video. Have a great day, and we will see you soon. Bye.